Welcome to the Global Roundtable organized by the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Today we have the honor and the pleasure uh, of the company of Mr. Matthew Holtz, Director of the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. Welcome Mr. Holtz, it's a pleasure to host you today. Thank you, Natasha. And before we start our conversation with our guest, let us introduce Mr. Holtz to the audiences. Mr. Holtz previously served with the United Nations in the 1990s at headquarters and in the field. He has extensive experience in peacemaking, peacekeeping and post-conflict nation building in the public and non-profit sectors. From the early 1990s until 2001, he served the United Nations in multiple roles, including providing policy and legal advice for the United Nations Protection Force leadership during the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. In 1995, he opened the first office in Sarajevo for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and returned to Sarajevo to focus on rebuilding the Bosnian judicial system for the office of the High Representative of Bosnia. In 2001, Mr. Hodes went to work for the Carter Center from 2003 to 2007, he was director of the Conflict Resolution Program, where he advised former President of the United States, Mr. Jimmy Carter, on matters relating to armed conflicts and political disputes. While leading the Center's mediation and negotiations assistant activities around the world. In 2010, Mr. Hodes went on to serve as director of programs for Club de Madrid. The United Nations Alliance of Civilizations announced his post as incoming director on February the 1st, 2013. So it's a very wide uh, scope of work, Mr. Hodes, all around the world. And a lot of experience in peace building, peacemaking, nation building. And here you are as the director of the United Nations Alliance of Civilization. Uh, could you tell us a little bit how does your experience come into the role of the association that you had and what is the mission, what is the vision of the institution you represent? Well, thank you, Natasha. And, uh, it's always a little bit uh, uh, humbling to hear that recitation of how old I've become. <laughs> uh, the, the real link between what I used to do and what I do now is with the importance of civil society. Uh, what we learned uh, in negotiation processes, whether it was in the former Yugoslavia uh, or in the case of my Carter Center experiences from places as diverse as Venezuela, the Middle East, uh, Nepal, is the growing importance of civil society in efforts uh, to resolve, in some cases to prevent, uh, and in every instance to reconcile post-conflict. Uh, the Alliance is the Secretary General's soft power tool of uh, preventive diplomacy. And a core feature of everything that the Alliance is about mm -hmm. is about recognizing and then empowering civil society movements who are engaged in the work that uh, is, is is really quite indispensable to advancing the international agenda. You mentioned soft power diplomacy. Can you tell us a little bit more? What are the tools of soft power diplomacy that the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations wants to promote, is promoting? Uh, do you think it's really used today? Is it deployed as much as we could all help it deploy? What is its importance? Well, the classical definition of soft power diplomacy had to do with the use of uh, forces that are not political, military, or economic. What does that leave you with? Primarily it leaves you with social and cultural approaches to relationships between societies. And that's where the Alliance has its greatest value added. Uh, the four pillars of programming for the Alliance is designated by the high-level uh, panel that the Secretary General had brought together uh, relate to youth, education, the media, and migration. Why would that have been 
a discussion back in 2005 when that group was in panels. Well, the first and the most important one, one that I think translates quite easily over all of my experiences, was the prominence of youth as a driver, uh, a driver for conflict in the case of dis, uh, disaffected youth that become uh, you know, susceptible to messages of violence, uh, youth as drivers of the future. Uh, then when you talk about media, as we've talked about in the past, uh, the media becomes an imme immense driver of popular opinion. And we know from our past experiences and conflicts that the manipulation of the media has a great deal to do with creating uh, the, con the context in which conflicts can erupt. Uh, we saw this in Somalia in 92. We saw this in the Balkans throughout the wars. Uh, we see it today in a variety of different places where the treatment of identity groups uh, has a great deal to do with the way in which general public opinion is formulated. Uh, I would argue that the high-level panel saw education as an adjunct uh, to the issue of youth, largely because teaching youth the appropriate values is an important responsibility for the international community. Uh, and then the issue of migration, I think, really is quite interesting in, in terms of uh, it coming up in a 2005 meeting, 2006. The logic there is that uh, one of the things that uh, became increasingly important in the post-9-11 world was the treatment of the other. Mm -hmm. That the notion that people were coming from other places that created, in some cases, uh, a sense of dispossession uh, among certain population groups. This was particularly notable in Europe uh, in the early part of the last decade. And you see it even now with riots that we've seen in places like yes. Paris or the outskirts of Stockholm, or the reaction in Italy to uh, migration flows coming from Africa. And so uh, I, I think that high-level panel that uh, then Secretary General Anand paneled in 2005-2006 was really pretty prescient in coming up with these, these pillars. So that's how we try to employ our activities. And so for the high representative, uh, Ambassador Al Nasser, the core of what we do has to be a combination of his personal interventions on issues relating to these topics and the project activity that we try to undertake uh, focused on those pillars. So you mentioned a uh, migrant issue. Uh, actually, there are about 232 million international migrants now in the world. And since 1990, the number of international migrants in the n north increased by around 65%. And in the South, it increased by about 34 uh, percent. So the issue of social cohesion has become more and more important in many countries, as you mentioned previously. Uh, what do you think are the most important elements that can help us build a better and more resilient and enduring social cohesion in these communities that are affected by this international migration. Just before I came over here today, I was at a, a meeting uh, in the ECOSOC chamber that related to the role of cities as laboratories for social integration, uh, particularly of migrant groups. One of the things that we are looking at is the notion that Social inclusion is a combination of both policy prescriptions that have to be done by governments, but also societal changes that have to happen at the societal level, where community values have to be inculcated that are welcoming uh, to migrants. One of the things that we've learned over time is that there's both a selfless agenda for communities to uh, be adoptive and uh, welcoming of uh, immigrants. That is the concept of just doing the right thing. It, it's a it's fairly common uh, occurrence in societies that have traditionally welcomed right. immigrants. Less, uh, less noticeable in societies that were not based on immigration flows. But then there's another agenda which is more selfish. And the reality is that when you look at economic growth patterns, especially at the urban level, 
the, the communities that have been better capable of absorbing immigration in ways where social inclusion was a part of the agenda that made immigrants capable of feeling part of the community, where there were no policy restrictions on how uh, an immigrant was able to find employment, how an immigrant was able to converse. In other words, even if we talk about language issues, uh, was a community capable of providing language skills and training to new arrivals? Uh, were there forms of housing discrimination, either official or unofficial, right. that created the potential for ghettoization of right. new arriving groups? These are all issues that have direct economic impact on these communities. Right. So yes, part of it is doing the right thing, but part of it is doing the right thing for yourself. Yes. That these communities, and by uh, extension these countries, did better economically when they were better capable of absorbing new arrivals. So you say some of that should come from the government, but some of that should also come from non-governmental institution, from the society itself. Yes, right. I know that many of your programs uh, promote that and work with non-governmental institutions to orchestrate this kind of susceptibility and sensitivity to a better social cohesion. Right. Uh, would you like to highlight some of these programs and, and their successes? Well, one of the things that we do as part of trying to recognize and then empower civil society groups is reflected in some of the uh, projects that we've done. One, for example, is a project we do in partnership with BMW Group uh, called the Intercultural Innovation Award. And these are not necessarily directed directly towards migration issues, but a lot of them impact on it. Basically what the criteria for the award is that civil society groups who are involved in attempts to try to bridge gaps between cultural elements of a society, uh, you know, apply for the award. The ones who are recognized get a cash award up front to uh, help with their ability to expand on what they're doing and they also get 12 months of mentorship. Because what we find is that civil society groups uh, sometimes lack some of the basic skills when it comes to the business side. Of so you want to support them in their sustainability them. in the future? Exactly. So an example of the type of group that we're talking about was one uh, based in originally in Mexico City where uh, a young man had a small organization that was trying to help uh, people in Distrito Federal who had a uh, a problem integrating into the local community because they spoke native languages and not Spanish as a primary language. And their ability to get employment, their ability to secure social services had been restricted because of linguistic differences. And so how do you make it possible for them to fully integrate while not asking them to give up their, uh, their native Mother language? Mother tongue. That's what his civil society group is all about. And through the work that we've done with, uh, with that group, with the recognition and the training, they've been able to expand their operations in Mexico and are now looking to expand into Guatemala. So uh, another question would be also, how does your organization participate in the present process of the development of sustainable development goals? Well, that the UNDP obviously has the lead on the Secretariat's involvement in uh, the SDGs and the post-2015 agenda. What they've asked us to do as part of the planning process, they have certain uh, areas of focus. One of them is culture and development. And so what they've asked us to do is to contribute to that, or that pillar. The Alliance is a relatively small organization, so uh, compared to UNDP or UNESCO, or any of the specialized agencies, we don't have the capacity to lead on such a topic. But we can provide input, which is what we've done as they move forward. What I find interesting about the concept is that I think it says a lot that UNDP was prepared to acknowledge that as you move forward with a broad-based uh, international strategy, that the issue of culture is worthy of discussion at that highest level. Uh, you know, one could make the argument that uh, uh, these development strategies that we think about get translated from some, you know, overarching political document to programs that happen in the field. 
Right. And once they happen in the field, the question then becomes, uh, is this particular strategy that was drafted in New York or drafted in Washington or London or Berlin or Stockholm, is it culturally relevant to the setting in which it's being applied? Right. That capacity to analyze that issue and make that a critical issue uh, at the uh, planning stage, I think, is uh, a development real, well worth uh, noting. So you would be able to provide a lot of input to the process on sustainable development goals, particularly in the area of cultural well, development, we'll and make sure that the resolutions are really the ones that are relevant and can be efficiently carried out on well, the practical level. I wouldn't level. want to overstate what our impact will be on that institutionally. Uh, it's enough that UNDP has recognized that for the purpose of the debate that's going to take place, that culture and development is a, is a topic that must be covered. The nature of our contribution intellectually will be something we'll work out with UNDP, but I'm sure our voice will be heard. Thank you. And before we end, I would like to ask you a personal question. I know that you have a lot of experience, a very wide, geographically wide experience in peacemaking process. Mm -hmm. What have you learned? What have you learned all across the world about the peacemaking process? That is difficult. That it requires a, an openness to uh, take chances. Uh, it requires, at its best, an almost anthropological quality of understanding about the various groups that are uh, in conflict with one another. And it requires an enormous amount of patience. I'm always reminded of uh, uh, a line that George Mitchell used after the successful conclusion of uh, the uh, mediation over Northern Ireland. And I'll paraphrase because I don't know the exact quote. But someone was congratulating him on his great success. And he says, well, th there was one day of success. There were 790 days of failure leading up to that day of success. Anyone who goes into this line of work without knowing that that's what they will be facing, with no assurance that that day of success will be at the back end of that process, that's, that's what you need. So it means a lot of patience, yeah. a lot of faith, persistence. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Holtz. It was a real pleasure to talk to you today. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Global Roundtable organized by the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Today we have talked to Mr. Matthew Holtz, Director of the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations.